The organ prelude today is a setting of the hymn, The Gift of Love. It's an old English folk song that's known by many as The Water is Wide. As I play the piece today, I hope that it conveys a sense of calm to you as we begin worship. And welcome to worship. I'm Joe Prin, the Facilities Manager at the Cathedral of the Rockies. Thank you for taking your time today to join us from wherever you are. Please let us know that you're here, leave some comments, and share this service with a friend. Now let's relax, tune out the background noise, and worship together. Please join me in our call to worship. God has set this day before us, a day set apart, a day of rest and praise. God has set our lives before us, a span of years in which we love and learn and serve. 
God has set a divine seal upon our hearts so that we might live fully in deep love. Let us together rise up and worship God. Let us continue in worship together and sing holy, holy, holy. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, you opened the eyes of the blind, healed the sick, and forgave the sinful woman. And after Peter's denial, confirmed him in your love. Listen to our prayer, forgive all of our sins, renew your love in our hearts, and help us to live in perfect unity with our fellow Christians, that we may proclaim your saving power to all the world. Now let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Right. 
My name is Dwayne. I'm one of the pastors here at Cathedral of the Rockies, Boise First United Methodist Church. And if you don't have a church home, we want to be your church home. And if you don't have a pastor, I really want to be your pastor. Thanks for joining us today for worship. Can you think of a speech that you remember from a long time ago, probably four score and seven years ago? Yep, we get that one, Abraham Lincoln. But there are a few speeches that last throughout history. Maybe some you heard this week will have time to last a little longer. Maybe some next week. There was a speech given in 1910. Theodore Roosevelt was a speaker. He had finished his two terms as president, been traveling through Africa and Europe, and he gave a speech in Paris that has lasted a long time. Richard Nixon, when he was giving his farewell speech, took a quote from this speech. The president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, gave a copy of this speech to the World Cup rugby team as they fought against New Zealand and won. The Washington Nationals player, Mark DeRosa, would read it during the 2012 series as they were fighting against the St. Louis Cardinals. And he said, it fired me up. Speech has some interesting cultural touchstones. People like Miley Cyrus have had it tattooed on her body and it's been used in a Cadillac commercial. It's often called the man in the arena. Would you hear these words? Theodore Roosevelt, 1910. It's not the critic who counts, not the man or the one who points out how the strong one stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the one who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if they fail, at least they fail while daring greatly. 2020 has knocked most of us face down in the arena. And rising strong, we've been talking about for a couple of weeks, it's the ability, the spiritual practice of resetting our lives after we've been knocked down. Maybe the crowds 
gone silent as you're down in the arena. Like at a football game when, when a player gets hurt and the crowd, crowd waits to see what's really going on. Or maybe you're flat in the arena and you feel like the crowd is booing. They're aware of your mistake and they're almost ready to throw things. They're coming after you. Or maybe you can hear that one voice in the crowd saying, get up. No crisis lasts forever. We all have face down on the ground moments. They can be big ones. Like you're fired. They can be big ones like the doctor saying, I'm sorry, but it's cancer. They can be big ones where we say this relationship isn't going to last. They can be small ones like coming home after a day's work and find out the kids have eaten all the cookies, drank all the milk, and not put the trash out. The thing about the arena, the arena is that moment of life where we risk showing up, being seen. The arena is you becoming your kid's teacher this year. The arena is serving a neighbor in need and making sure they're okay during COVID. The arena is being willing to speak truth to power, to maybe show up and protest, be a voice for the voiceless. The arena is listening and learning in an age of racial transformation, learning that black lives matter. We've been seeking to live wholeheartedly. And one of the texts we looked at a couple weeks ago is that passage from Galatians where Paul writes to the church in Galatia and he says, look, when the Spirit controls your life, here's the evidence everybody will see. They'll see love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. What a great example of wholehearted living. So it was just last Friday, I was finishing my Friday morning run on the green belt and, and my phone rang and before I know it, I could hear a friend's passionate, frustrated voice talking about the issues of COVID and instead of listening with compassion, I matched their frustration. I matched their anger. Matter of fact, maybe I even beat it. I could, I could hear an echo of Kathy saying to me when the kids were little, you do not have to become like our five-year-old. Sometimes it's so easy for emotion to take over. It was just a moment later where I began to listen to that moment. Rising strong invites us to feel our emotions, to be present in the discomfort. I started to hear that echo if the Spirit controls your life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What happened to that? Dwayne, what happened to that? I had to stop and ask, what was I feeling when they called? What took over? Wholehearted living means engaging our life from places of worthiness. This is why I say to you almost every week, you are loved by and you matter to God. You're enough. You are enough. See, we're all imperfect and vulnerable. In times, I need to be reminded that God is present and that I'm loved and that I'm enough. I want to share with you parts of two stories today. The first story is a Jesus story. It comes to us from the Gospel of John. I love this story. It's John chapter 11 and just verse 1. Hear these words. This is from the NIV. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So Jesus is traveling with the followers, with his disciples. He gets news that his friend is sick. They're somewhere across the Jordan. Maybe they're near Jericho or further down. That would be 12, 15, 20 miles away. Your friend Lazarus is sick. 
When they finally arrive days later, they get the word, Lazarus is dead and he's been dead for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was present, she ran to her friend and she said these words, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You ever say that to God? God, if you'd have shown up, this would not have happened to me. God, if you'd have answered my prayer, this, I'd be in a different place. How often we forget Jesus reminded us. God said the, the sun will set on the, and the rain will fall on the just and the unjust. God's present in all things. Verse 32 says, when Mary saw Jesus, she too fell at his feet and she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The message translation says this, when Jesus saw her sobbing and the Jews sobbing with her, a deep anger welled up within him. He said, where did you put him? Master, come and see, they said. And now Jesus wept. This, this, is, this is kind of a face down in the arena moment. What do you think we should do with Jesus' emotions? Some translations try to soften this word. That was from the message translation. Some try to say Jesus was deeply moved or Jesus was greatly disturbed as if to kind of make this a moment of compassion. But the Greek that's captured there is best translated, Jesus was angry. And Jesus wept. And this is kind of not a, a few tears or sweaty eyeballs. This is, this is Jesus dirty cried. Wow. Rising strong. It requires us to be brave, to be vulnerable, to rumble with our feelings and to listen to emotions like grief. We are wonderfully made. Sometimes when we can't speak what the emotion is, our body's trying to tell us, we feel it within. If we can learn our way through these moments, these arena moments, if we can feel our way through these struggles, we can write our own brave endings. You may know this has been a, a face down in the arena kind of year for both Paul and Mackenzie, our very own Paul and Mackenzie Aiken. They've had a number of struggles come their way. Mackenzie had a stroke at the end of the year, a severe stroke. And then you might remember their son, Caden, was killed by suicide. And then COVID hit. What do you do when you're face down in the arena? face down on the ground. Listen to these words. Um, when I heard uh, from the doctor that Mackenzie had indeed had a stroke during her surgery, um, it was just, there was just tremendous disbelief. Uh, there was no way to even wrap my head around and truly comprehend what was going on because um, it, it seemed completely unreal. And I don't think it really made sense to me at all until I actually saw her in the ICU, exactly how grave a danger we were in and how much she had been through within only a few hours time. She had walked into the surgery room. Um, <laughs> she had gotten herself ready and and uh, couldn't walk and couldn't talk and couldn't use uh, her, left, her left side at all when she came out. Um, and it truly wasn't until after I'd gone home um, that I and had a really brief nap and some rest that I woke up and all the emotions just simply rushed uh, I, I was completely, I'd been completely in survival mode up until that point. Sort of like a case of the body snatchers. <laughs> and that's sort of the best way I can describe it because you do sort of wake up with a different brain and a different body and you have to embrace that 
and learned how to live with a different brain and a different body. And you can either curl up in a ball and freak out and pull the covers over your head and say, nope, I'm not gonna do this. Or you can be really determined, which is what I've chosen to do. And it's a choice you make every single day when you open your eyes. And that's what I choose to do. Um, we discovered that we've lost our boy. Um, we lost Caden to suicide. And um, and that, that was its own sense of disbelief. Uh, the, the, except at that point, I feel like we were so in tune with our emotions, the tears just flooded. And the, um, but I, I had to, I was escorted into the, into the hospital by um, a member of the Boise Police Department. And, um, and I had to tell Mackenzie that, um, that Caden, that Caden, well, yeah, Caden had died. And it was, and <laughs> there's nothing worse than, than seeing somebody that you love who's recovered so much in those six weeks. Hey, we learned how to walk, learned how to talk, swallow, um, um, had gobs of various different kinds of test, tests. We've been through um, uh, all of the, 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 the emotions that went with having to realize that she, that she, that just sitting up was, was complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd come so far and have that mo new moment when I had to say, um, I know that, you, <laughs> I know that we've come so far, but I have bad news. Worst news. And, um, and Caden, Caden is dead. He's, he's, he's no longer with us. Um, he took his life. And um, and then having to, to enter that again new phase of disbelief and loss and heartbreak, absolute heartbreak. It's complete heartbreak. Intense grief and loss and just this overwhelming sense of, of everything has moved, everything's moved. It was not unlike when we had, had the earthquake in, in March, everything moved and there was nothing we could do to, to change that new reality. It's incredibly slow, but don't give up. Just keep doing the work and give yourself grace, which is maybe the hardest thing to do. Give yourself grace and give yourself space to grow. Wow, what an amazing response. There are many of us that instead of feeling our hurt, we act out in hurt. Instead of acknowledging, acknowledging our pain, we inflict pain. Rather than feeling disappointed, we live disappointed. It's my hope that you will seek to rise strong as a spiritual practice. How do we do that? Well, one is to make worship a practice. The second is to, to just say this to you. Here's really the one action step I want you to consider. In the next couple of weeks, starting in September, we're going to do a new study, Eight Habits of Love. We'll be doing Zoom small groups, Zoom Bible studies, and these habits of love you will like because it's, it's reminding us of the habit of stillness, truth, play, candor, generosity, forgiveness, compassion, community. Whether you're in Virginia or Texas or Wisconsin or Maine, whether you're here in Idaho, why don't you send me an email, here's my email, and plan to join one of our small groups. We'll have multiple times, or maybe you wanna lead one. If you're interested in leading one, send me that email too, and we'll connect you to the curriculum and to the small groups. Now parents, we also have small groups, Sunday school small groups for your kids, and we will start those in a couple weeks. Again, send me an email with your kids' names and ages, and we'll get them connected to a small group through Family Life Ministry. Together, 
we can rise strong. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for the way your spirit is leading us and reminding us that a, a, an integrated life, a wholehearted life is full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May we be aware of our feelings, may we lean into them, and may we write our own ending of our story. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Friends, let's continue our worship as we give back our very best to God. It's our chance to honor God through our giving. You can give through the website or through these numbers that are here. You can text to give. You can mail in an old-fashioned check. Thank you for your generosity. And there proclaim, my God, how great 
to God. No crisis will last forever. There's always hope and others will help. Just ask. Would you receive these words of benediction? May the peace of Christ go with you wherever God leads you. May God walk with you in the wilderness and may God hold you in the storms of life when you're face down in the arena. May God bring you home rejoicing at the amazing things you've experienced together. May God bring you home rejoicing once again through these doors in the name of Jesus the Christ, amen.